know, I would this session. So good afternoon and welcome to Tuesday Topics. I'm so grateful that you all were able to join me today. I am actually on vacation uh, for this week. I'm at Hilton Head, which is a barrier island in South Carolina. Uh, hence, you see this little beach picture behind me. This is not my home. This is, uh, you know, an Airbnb. But uh, I'm so grateful that you've joined me today. And I'm sorry to say that last week when I tried to do the conferences from NTI, it was just so difficult because it was noisy and I had lectures going on as well. So I'm very happy that you came to be with me today. And today we're gonna to talk about alveolar recruitment maneuvers. So let me just get my screen share going uh, and we shall begin. And occasionally, of course, other folks will come on board. Sometimes when I have to move back and forth, that um, manipulates my slides just a tiny bit. So thank you very much again for joining. And I think we have a couple of new people. So that's really nice. It's always good to have a lot of people. So I want to talk about alveolar recruitment maneuvers, why we do them, when we do them, how we do them, and how that affects what we're doing as bedside nurses with patients who are receiving alveolar recruitment maneuvers. Now, I do want to remind you that we think about our, our, our basic definitions and the way in which we look at patients who have ARDS, very important for us to remember that uh, the first definition for ARDS was from the ARDS network, and that was published in 1994. Now, basic definition for ARDS then was that you had an acute onset of severe hypoxemia with loss of lung compliance, bilateral infiltrates visualized on chest x-ray. And at that time, because PA catheters were being used quite assertively at that time, your wedge pressure had to be less than 18 because there had to be an evaluation that this was not heart failure induced volume overload, but that this was lung parenchymal changes. And in those early definitions, just want to remind you about P to F ratio, PaO2 divided by the FiO2 in the decimal, which basically tells us whether the gas we gave the patient got to the alveoli and then diffused into the blood. Now that's a really important concept because the P to F ratio is something we should be sure that we are talking about when we're communicating with our respiratory therapist, and with our APP and physician colleagues, the P to F ratio is the primary defining criteria of hypoxemia, not really PaO2, because PaO2 doesn't take into account the uh, kinds of ventilatory support you are using when you're actually ventilating patients. So P to F is only used, only used when your patient is ventilated. In 2012, new criteria came out. That's the Berlin criteria, the Berlin definition for ARDS, still looking at P to F ratio, but removing uh, the wedge pressure criteria, because again, most people in 2012 were not using PA catheters. And that the onset may not be so quickly acute. It could take about a week to develop. You can see it in patients. Of course, we saw it just massively in COVID-19. You see it in patients who have severe sepsis and it is evolutional. So now we say about a week. About a week is what we're looking for, or what we're thinking about in that relationship. Okay, so edema is not really explained by what we would consider to be cardiac failure or just pure volume overload and bilateral opacities on chest X-ray or chest CT. But here's where the big difference occurred. So now the idea is you've got to be on PEEP and then we're looking at you're on PEEP plus you're on FiO2 and not really making a criteria about FiO2, just saying that your P to F is less than 300, but greater than 200. That's considered mild ARDS. P to F less than 200, but greater than 100. That is moderate ARDS. And severe ARDS is if your PAO, uh, PAO to FiO2 ratio is less than 100. So first and foremost, Every time you're talking with your physician colleagues, your APP colleagues, your respiratory therapy colleagues, and to each other, we should be actually using 
P to F as an explanation of the hypoxemic failure of our patients. Now, what that means is you might be using a lot of oxygen, but still the ratio is really poor. And when that ratio is poor, we know that means that you have lung dysfunction that might require alternative uh, methods to actually recruit the lung. So now I just wanna take a look at a simple drawing, actually looking at this CT of our patient, but then actually talking about the upright lung, which is a normal lung and tends to be over distended if you do not adjust the tidal volume for a lung that doesn't have a normal lung capacity. And as you descend into the lung, you actually will see here a small mm -hmm. zone of edema and then a little farther down consolidation. And then here at the, at the posterior surface that this is a patient who's laying supine at the posterior surface, you have severe atelectasis. Now, what we think about are these basic four regions and any patient that we have uh, designated that has a PF ratio that is poor and we have concern, the patient has ARDS, we're gonna think about all four of these regions, but what's gonna be most important is to protect the normal lung by not overventilating with volume and to open the atelectatic lung and keep it open. The edema and the consolidation will resolve over time, but these two surface areas are critically important in terms of the way in which we determine how we're going to affect the lung. Now, protecting the lung, again, is what we're usually doing with the upright lung. So if your patient is sitting at 45 degrees, the upright lung will be the apices. If they are supine, the upright lung will be the anterior portion. But if you are lucky enough to actually be able to prone your patients, you will be shifting the upright lung. So when the patient's supine, it will be anterior. And when they are prone, it will be posterior, which is one of the best ways of all for us to protect the lung. And that's something that we as nurses really wanna consider and consider early on. Okay, so I'm gonna think about my patients and when the lungs look wet and when they don't have heart failure, when the lung is non-compliant, and when the lung is non-responsive to oxygen, this is when we're gonna consider recruitment maneuvers. Recruitment maneuvers are methodologies designed to open the collapsed lung, uh, not a collapsed lung from a pneumo or a hemo, but alveolar collapsed lung, the alveolar surfaces. This is what we're gonna consider when we have patients who have basic issues with lung uh, gas exchange, most particularly oxygen. So remember, using a P to F ratio is very important when we're evaluating the lung. Now, if we think about the pathology, first of all, direct injury means that I have a direct injury to the alveolar lining, that it's actually a lung injury first and then a vascular injury. It always ends up with both but direct injury is an alveolar lining that, or the alveolar architecture, the alveolar lining has been destroyed generally from, uh, from aspiration or from pneumonia. And then we talk about the indirect injury, which is actually much more common for us. Indirect injury typically starts from the blood vessels first and then involves the alveoli. Now, why is this important? Why do you even care? Why am I talking about this? That's because patients with indirect injury tend to be more responsive, A, to proning, and B, to alveolar recruitment maneuvers, because it's not really a primary destruction of the alveoli. It's really more related to inflammation, inflammatory mediation, interstitial edema, and flooding of the alveoli rather than direct injury to the alveolar surface. So it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we don't actually say, well, we're only gonna do recruitment if it's indirect injury. We just know that the major response and the sooner you do it, the better is for the indirect injury patient. So we think about trauma. We think about somebody who's got uh, pulmonary hemorrhaging or pulmonary contusions they typically will respond very early to strategies designed to recruit the lung in an indirect injury. 
Okay, so if we just look at direct versus indirect, you can see basically what I've said, direct injury, aspiration, inhalation injury, pulmonary contusion, near drowning, pneumonia. And then we look over here at indirect injury, and this is trauma, much more specific. Patients with sepsis, COVID-19, hemorrhagic shock, cardiopulmonary bypass, those are indirect injuries. That means, and burn injury. Not, not inhalation, just a major burn inflammation. Remember, inhalation is a direct injury. So we're just thinking about this as we strategize who are the patients that we want to actually uh, provide recruitment maneuvers to, and also very importantly, the patients that we are going to think about as being responders to and proning scenarios. So again, we go back to our visual and we remind ourselves that we're gonna protect the functional lung. That is typically the anterior lung. And we're gonna recruit really all the rest of the lung, but recruitment maneuvers are really designed open the atelectatic lung and will assist with uh, mobilization of fluid out of the alveoli, opening up the alveoli, reducing the consolidation. So many of you who are working in ICU know we talk a lot about lung protective ventilation, that's low tidal volume ventilation, but I wanna make sure you're appreciating when you do protective lung ventilation, low tidal volume for predicted body weight, all you're doing is protecting this component of the lung, which is fantastic, by the way, wonderful, but you must also be doing something to open up the rest of the lung to recruit the lung. So again, we're strategizing, we're talking, we're participating in rounds, we're talking about the P to F ratio. We make a suggestion about proning. We, that's something that we do. That's really important for us in terms of trying to recruit the lung. Now, I'm gonna just talk about some of that basic diagnosis, right? So basic diagnosis, in the radiographic realm shows that we have a person here who has got diffuse bilateral infiltrates. And this is what we call that ground glass appearance. That ground glass appearance shows us that we have derecruited alveoli. Well, and what's really important is that when you uh, don't have heart failure, you'll you generally have a normal heart size, right? And there's not usually a pleural effusion that is visualized. So when we think about this diagnosis, we're going to use our x-ray. We're going to say we've got this bilateral infiltrates and they are diffuse. They're not the same. They're, uh, they're uh, not homogenous, they're heterogeneous, and we don't have evidence of heart failure. And then we take a look at uh, chest CT. And again, on the chest CT here, you can see that you have that ground glass phenomenon. And there's little specks throughout the lung that actually just do actually look like ground glass. And then the other aspect, which is the one that doesn't require us to have uh, training in interpretation of CT or in radiograph. And that is that our patient is hypoxic and typically if left to their own devices, they will be breathing quite rapidly, usually greater than 20 or 22 times a minute. But most importantly is the fact that the lung is non-compliant. Now, if you've ever heard me speak on anything, you know, I talk a lot about pressure is change in compliance over change in volume. So here you're looking at a beautiful open lung. Oh, it's so gorgeous. And it's just like one of the most expensive balloons. You bought at an expensive balloon store and you blow it up. It just whoo, opens up. It's so easy because it's very compliant versus this lung with all of the infiltrate, which has actually caused the alveoli to be compressed. So that fluid in the interstitium, the flooding in the alveoli, the alveoli are no longer recruitable and no longer compliant. So we can appreciate this chest X-ray. We're gonna see that when we give volume into that lung, it's gonna yield a relatively low pressure. You never give the lung pressure. You always give, you flow, you flow gas. So when you flow the gas into the lung that's compliant, it will be at a low pressure. When you flow gas into a lung that's non-compliant, it'll be a high pressure. So we'll have a pressure visualization on our ventilator. Might be just the peak pressure, but typically it's gonna be something else known as plateau pressure. So we're gonna take a look at that in just a second. 
But I just want to remind you again, so you looked at that chest x-ray, this chest x-ray, oh, it looks like the whole lung is whited out, but actually it's not. Typically, it's really important to remember that you see all that diffuse infiltrate and you're seeing that as you look through the chest with a radiograph. But when you go to a lung CT, you will see typically that this unrecruited, volume overloaded surface of the lung is typically in the dependent lung, which is why these patients cannot stay in a supine position. Why our very earliest commitment when we understand they may have indirect or direct injury is that patient is gonna be moving all the time. Maybe you're not proning, but you're changing their lung position, steeply rotating them side to side, very rarely keeping patients in a supine position, but always mobilizing them so that you can protect them from this accumulation of fluid and the under-recruited alveoli in the dependent lung surface. Now up here, this is the lung that you have to protect with your ventilatory strategies. That's why you use a low tidal volume because instead of being a nice functional lung, you actually have a relatively dysfunctional lung and only a small surface area that can be recruited. And then, I'm sorry, this says B, but it is letter C. This zone right here is subject to very significant and profound injury when we're using a little bit higher tidal volume than what's been called for in this patient with a lung protective strategy. What does that mean? What it means is when you have high pressure alarms going off at the bedside and the patient's not chomping on his ET tube, he's not tonguing it, he's not fighting, he doesn't have a mucus plug and the tube is in the right position. You have to then consider that you're giving too much tidal volume for that patient's lung. And that's gonna be really important because if we allow that, we just, some of us might say, I know you wouldn't, but some of us might say, well, that's the respiratory therapist's job. I don't really understand ventilation. I'm really just doing the best I can, trying to keep the patient alive, which is admirable, but you can't do that because your therapist has 40 patients, 30 patients. They might not get back to see your patient till much later. And so they're having a high pressure alarm, which we silence and, you know, we just keep silencing it and we're not really paying attention. And it's actually telling us about that dysfunctional lung. So again, really, really, really important to see what happens here. So you'll see here, this is a lung with ARDS. This is during exhalation. So all these smaller airways and alveoli have collapsed. Some of our conducting airways have collapsed and only the functional component of the lung remains inflated. And then when we inspire, you can see that you have over distended the functional lung. So now I'm delivering that tidal volume into the patient or I'm flowing gas into the patient and I've over distended the functional lung, really haven't opened up the dysfunctional lung, but some of these uh, alveoli will be repetitively open and closed and that's gonna promote more tissue damage. So really, really important. I want to make sure we appreciate the zone of risk in any person who has direct or indirect injury is the surface area that remains dependent. So first, foremost, last, one of the things we need to be aware of is as soon as a patient is intubated on the ventilator, you have to try to aggressively change positions. Now that doesn't mean everybody's gonna get prone. What it means though, is that this every one hour, every two hours, steep lateral positional change with wedges and pillows and whatever way you can do it, that is not a suggestion. It's an absolute necessity if we want to protect the lung. That's something we can do, even without an order, we can do that. All right, so now I'm going to just talk really quickly about how we know if the lung is compliant. Just want to remind you about three pressures that we measure. Those pressures are the pressures that are generated when we flow gas into the lung. Remember, the less compliant the lung, the higher the pressure will be. Now the peak <clears throat> inspiratory pressure is the pressure that is evaluated in the whole circuitry from, and from the ET tube to the trachea, 
to the main bronchi, all the way down to the alveoli, and reminding ourselves that the lung is encased in somewhat of a rigid compartment, the thoracic cage. So very, very important for us to remember that. Then I go to mean airway pressure. Mean airway pressure is the average pressure between inspiration and exhalation that is maintained throughout the entire circuit. And it is mean airway pressure is the strategy that you are applying when you're using PEEP. Because as you increase PEEP, that overall increases the mean airway pressure and it maintains alveolar opening. Oh my God, that's so important. I'm going to say it again. The mean airway pressure is what maintains alveolar opening. So when I add PEEP, I'm increasing that mean airway pressure and maintaining lung opening. Now there's another pressure that is very important. The plateau pressure is the pressure that is measured at the end of inspiration. So if I press an inspiratory hold button on my ventilator screen, what will happen is the valves on the exhalation, uh, on the exhalation limb of my tubing will close and gas gets trapped in the lung. Now, what that means is that the higher that pressure, that the gas was distributed to a smaller surface area. So I want to be sure we appreciate that. Plateau pressure is a measure of the pressure that is generated when gas is trapped in the lung. The less compliant the lung, the higher that pressure will be. Our goal is to always get plateau pressure to something that is more reasonable. So I'm gonna press my inspiratory hold button. You shouldn't do it, ask your therapist to do it. They might teach you to do it, but you gotta know what to do with that information as well. It's not just something that we measure. Now you can't measure this on pressure control because you're controlling the pressure. You can only measure it on volume control and it can only be measured on a vent delivered breath, not on a spontaneous breath. So I press that inspiratory hold button. I just press it and release. The ventilator will evaluate the mechanism of breathing and on a volume controlled breath, you will get this closure of the exhalation valve. So that's what we call the plateau pressure. Plateau pressure should always be less than 25. Peak pressure, remember, is the pressure that is generated when gas flows in on inspiration. So this tells me about inspiration and this tells me about alveolar recruitment. That's, that's as simple as I can make it. And it is really simple. This peak pressure, that's the peak inspiratory pressure, is what you see when your patient gets a breath. And it encompasses the ET tube, the trachea, the pulmonary bronchi, all the way to the alveoli and encased inside the thoracic cage. Plateau actually knocks out the measurement of anything other than the alveoli and the thoracic cage. So it means it's much more specific. The plateau pressure is the distending pressure of the lung. Now that is incredibly important because the higher that pressure, that means the less of my lung is distended because I went from being a big lung to having a tiny lung. So plateau pressure actually is what we're gonna to use to determine where our PEEP should be where we should be utilizing recruitment maneuvers because if that plateau pressure is elevated, that tells us that the lung is not functional. Now, normally peak pressure, which is the inspiratory pressure minus the plateau pressure is usually around 10 to 15. But if the lung is stiff, the plateau pressure is gonna get higher and higher and higher, and it will be much closer to the peak pressure. So. Remember, we don't want to overventilate here because we're going to try to protect the functional lung, but we also have to consider recruiting the, uh, the non-compliant lung. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what used to be called a Puritan Bennett uh, 840 ventilator. It's the main ventilator we use at Grady. Other, other systems use different ventilators. We also use a newer version of this, but it's all basically the same. You hit an inspiratory hold, you release it, and you'll see right here is that now we see 
that there's an inspiratory hold and that tells you what the pressure is on your inspiratory hold. This is the flow of gas. It means that the gas went in, but it wasn't allowed to escape. Yellow tells you that's gas flowing out. Green tells you that's gas flowing in. We've closed those valves and all we did was hit the button and release it. The ventilator determines when it's the right time to do it. And here you actually see your patient's P plateau. Okay, so their peak is 40 and their P plateau is 36. The difference is only four. And this is untenable. This is a completely dysfunctional lung, okay? So that's a really important for us to remember that when we see that P plateau pressure that's elevated, we're gonna be concerned. Okay, so that's your peak right here and your P plat right there. Okay, so remember the first thing that we're gonna do when we have a stiff lung is we're gonna protect the functional lung. And there is something else that we can do if we're comfortable. And uh, actually some of our ec most excellent therapists tell me that many respiratory therapists aren't that uh, comfortable with what we call the volume pressure graph. The volume pressure graph actually shows you when does the volume actually start to move into the lung. So I've got a patient here who's on PEEP, that's a PEEP of five. The breath starts not at zero, but at five, the breath starts and gas starts to flow in. But if your lung is functional, you should have a rapid upstroke, but this lung is not functional. It takes a long time before that gas really flows into the lung. This little place where you see the uptake here, that's called the lower inflection point, okay? Now I'm not here to help you read volume pressure graphs because they really require a lot of effort. I look at them all the time and I think I'm probably wrong in my interpretation 50% of the time. But what I want you to appreciate is lots of times we set our PEEP at some standard, our docs say eight centimeters water pressure PEEP and we put them on eight, but the lung isn't open. We have to actually have a lot of good discussion about opening the lung. So here's a lung, as you can see, quite atelectatic. And you can look at five of PEEP, then we're going up and you can see as you go up, you get more and more lung recruitment. But here is the low inflection point. That's somewhere right around eight to 10. This is a patient actually supposed to show you a person who's not really on any PEEP. And as you take your breath, you do recruit some of the lung and then you de-recruit and then you recruit and then you de-recruit. And this actually causes what we call a shear force injury of opening and closing. So by the way, everybody needs to use protective lung ventilation. So if we look over here at conventional ventilation with collapsed alveoli and functional alveoli, you'll see with that volume breath, you're not really recruiting the collapsed alveoli, but you're over distending the dysfunctional, I mean, the functional alveoli. So you've over distended that. With protective ventilation, protective ventilation, meaning a low tidal volume plus PEEP, you can see protective ventilation. You're going to have a little bit better opening. This is your alveolar collapse, a little bit better opening without over distending the alveoli. And that's why we say with lung dysfunction, we always reduce the tidal volume. So you here, this is a breath that I would normally take around 800 cc's, but with protective ventilation, we're gonna drop that tidal volume. And if you're wanting to know what tidal volume you should be uh, requesting, although I think probably you don't have to do that very often if you're in a functional ICU, that you would actually use the ARDS net space PBW calculator because it's not really about the body weight, but it's about the gender and the height. And that's going to be a predicted body weight calculator, which tells you how much volume you should be giving for that lung to protect it. Now, why do we do that? Because high tidal volume is going to cause very severe lung strain. Okay. Now, if we are giving a high tidal volume and we have excessive pressure, that's gonna cause what we call barotrauma, which is lung stress. And then we have shear stress, which means alveoli ultimately open and then collapse and open and then collapse and open and then collapse. That's called atelectatic trauma. 
So our perspective is driven by what the pressure measure is, you will reduce the tidal volume and you will increase the PEEP. Protect the lung with a low tidal volume, increase the PEEP for alveolar recruitment. PEEP is what actually gives you what we call functional residual capacity. The amount of volume that stays in the lung after a normal exhalation. And if you have a normal functional residual capacity, the lung stays open. But because of the force and the collapsing pressure of the fluid and the loss of the alveolar membrane, your alveoli are collapsed and you have a decreased functional residual capacity. That's why we use PEEP. Okay, so again, when we think about lung protective ventilation, typically we use six to eight mLs per kg of predicted body weight or ideal body weight that has nothing to do with how much you weigh. It has to do with your gender and your height. And that's why you have to look at it on a PBW calculator. Again, ARDS net space PBW calculator, fantastic. Tells you exactly how much tidal volume per breath you should be giving your patient. And then we have to actually consider PEEP that is individualized to patients because we need a PEEP that increases your functional residual capacity and protects your alveoli from collapsing. That will help us open the lung and better gas exchange and protect your lung from shear force injury. If I'm not able to do that with individualized PEEP, then, and, and lots of times I don't know what your PEEP needs are until I do an alveolar recruitment maneuver. So we're gonna recruit your alveoli and then individualize your PEEP along with low tidal volumes that protect your lung. So always wanna remind ourselves that, and so this is just, this is from an anesthesia book. So sorry, cause I kind of took this picture and I didn't change that. But basically it's just saying that when your patient is supine, you have cephalad moving towards the head displacement of the diaphragm. Very hard to overcome that if you're not using adequate PEEP or alveolar recruitment maneuvers. So I, if you've ever heard me talk about ventilation, you've seen this picture. I love this because I feel like it's such a great way for us to look at the lung. So this is a lung with five of PEEP. Now we're gonna add another five of PEEP to make it up to 10. And you're gonna see the lung will open more. And then we're gonna add another five of PEEP to make it 15 and then another three to bring it to 18. And you can see now the whole lung is recruited at 18 of PEEP. So really important to appreciate that our concerns are always about opening our lung. And opening the lung is separate from protecting. Remember protecting is primarily about the functional lung. Recruiting is about the collapsed alveoli. So we're always gonna consider recruitment maneuvers. So remember with the ARDS, a large portion of the lung is de-recruited. De Some of it may be recruitable. We don't know that if we don't try to open the lung. Now, de-recruited lung is of course worsened if you are obese, if your abdominal pressure is high, if you're getting high uh, concentration of FiO2 greater than 60%, if the patient disconnects from the ventilator, if we're doing tracheal suctioning, all of that causes de-recruitment of the lung. Now we wanna be sure that what we're applying actually opens our alveoli. So normal weight patients, six to seven centimeters water pressure is what we typically say for a normal weight patient. A larger patient has to be on 10 to 15. That's just starting pressures. And always reminding ourselves that if the patient is in an extreme position, meaning laying flat, I think none of us really lay our patients completely flat anymore, but that will significantly impact them and reduce their functional residual capacity. So individualizing PEEP means that you actually have someone who can look at that low inflection point when the lung is actually open, and that's where we're going to set our PEEP. That's what's going to help us to recruit the lung. So really, really important that to appreciate that uh, the driving pressure is your P plat minus your PEEP. P plat minus PEEP. That's in a volume control mode. 
in a pressure control mode, it's peak inspiratory pressure minus the PEEP. That's the driving pressure. That means the pressure that is generated in order to achieve a functional tidal volume. If you're on a volume control mode and your uh, driving pressure increases, the only thing that you can do is to increase your PEEP or do a recruitment maneuver. So this is a really important concept for us. We should all be talking about, it's pretty straightforward, in VC, P plat minus P. So before you saw our patient, our, our patient earlier, uh, and we need that driving pressure really should be less than 15, right? So we saw that patient earlier, they had a P plat of 36 and a PEEP of 13. That meant that they were at 23 driving pressure. Now, what we wanna do for him is to open up his PEEP and narrow that difference. Because what that means, the higher the PEEP, the more open the lung is and the better ventilation that we're giving our patients. So this is just a little visual of that. And we're gonna just try to open your lungs so that you have less requirement for driving pressure to provide a lung volume. Okay, so I'm gonna go here. Three things that we can talk about with lung recruitment maneuvers. Okay, first, there's a basic sigh then there's sustained inflation, and then there's extended sign maneuvers where we do stepwise PEEP. So I'm only gonna talk about sustained inflation and incremental or stepwise PEEP because that's really the best thing. So we'll look at this, sustained inflation and incremental PEEP. And then this is another form of ventilatory support that can indeed open the lung and that would be pressure control inverse ratio ventilation. Okay, so let's start with sustained inflation recruitment maneuver. This is the one that is used the most, it's the best description, and in general has the best values. What it means is along with your therapist and with your physician approval in general, you are actually going to apply 40 centimeters of water pressure for 40 seconds. What that's going to do is it's going to open up the lung. And that's terrifying to most people. 40 centimeters of water pressure, but you're trying to open the lung. The lung is not open. You've got to open the lung. Now, the problem is that when you're using that amount of water pressure, you can actually have significant hypotension. So really, really important. You need to be sure your patient has a, a sustainable systolic blood pressure between 100 and 200, and that their heart rate is not tachycardic when you stop start. They have to be adequately sedated. The recommendation overall has been uh, paralytics, but that's, that's kind of gone away in the recent years. So you should be sedated to a negative three, negative four on your RAS scale. And if your FiO2 is less than 100%, you need to increase the FiO2. We're just going to do that for about five minutes before we do the recruitment maneuver. Now you have to change your ventilation mode. So if it's on assist control ventilation, you're gonna put them to SIMB with PEEP. Now you're not worried about whether or not they're gonna take a breath, although that'd be lovely if they did, you're actually worried about applying that PEEP. So you put them on SIMV and what you're basically doing is just giving them CPAP. That's basically what it is at 40 centimeters of water pressure. And we're gonna leave it there for about 40 seconds. So you can increase it a little bit more slowly or you can go directly up to 40 and that's typically 40, not 45, unless the patient is really large for 45 seconds. So what you've done is you've given them a sustained inflation. That means they're not necessarily taking any breaths. What you've done is you've popped the lung open. That's why you put them on SIMB. So really, really, really important to know that this is the most common recruitment maneuver, but if the patient drops his pressure or if, uh, if he drops his systolic blood pressure less than 90, or if he drops greater than 30, you've got to start, stop. If his heart rate goes up above 140, you've got to stop. If his SATs drop by 5% and is less than 90%, you have to stop the recruitment maneuver. So these are the signs of distress that are sometimes seen when we're doing a recruitment maneuver. Now, what you're gonna do is you put that CPAP or PEEP at 40, you're gonna decrease that. After that 45 seconds, you're gonna reduce that, not going from 45 back down to 10 or 45 down to 13. And actually most therapists will tell you they like to reduce about once 
every 30 seconds. So they reduced by five every 30 seconds. So we went from 40 and then we go to 35, then to 30 and then on down. And what that actually will do is it will actually tell you when you start to de-recruit. Because let's say your SATs went up to 100%. And then as you're bringing that down, you're gonna to start to see the patient mobilizing tidal volume. When that tidal volume decreases or their SATs drop, that's where you're gonna stop. And you have now found the individualized peak for the patient. If patients have to have two recruitment maneuvers that require early termination because the patient has this, uh, uh, this sensitivity or distress, not going to do any more recruitment maneuvers for at least 12, usually 24 hours until you have gotten the patient to a more sustainable heart rate and a more sustainable blood pressure. Okay, incremental PEEP, second most common, and I think we see this one a lot, where the PEEP just goes up from, uh, from 10 or so to 20, 30, and 40 every two minutes. So you can see you incrementally went up on PEEP until you achieve that PEEP of around 40 centimeters of water pressure. And that means the alveolar pressure might be 55. So we're right around 40 centimeters of water pressure and we decrease it slowly. So remember what I said about the uh, sustained? And then I said a lot of therapists like to use the incremental decrease. They didn't go up incrementally, but they use the incremental decrease because that helps us to find where the patient should be. Now, some folks feel this is quite effective. And I think the marriage of the two, meaning you go up to 40 and then you reduce in increments, tends to be the most common way that we see folks now using recruitment maneuvers. Now, there's lots of other ventilation methods that open the lungs, airway pressure release ventilation, which is sustained high pressure with a short release, which means that we prevent the alveoli from collapsing, but we also, because we rapidly release the pressure that allows us to remove CO2. Pressure controlled inverse ratio ventilation, which is a prolonged high pressure with a short exhalation time and high frequency oscillation. These are other ventilation methods that open lungs. Each one of those requires at least an hour to discuss. So we're not really talking about ventilation methods. We're really talking about alveolar recruitment maneuvers. So in conclusion, very first thing is always evaluate your patient's oxygenation, okay? Once you open the lung, you should actually have better oxygenation. So first and foremost, remember, Responders tend to be indirect injured patients rather than direct injury patients, but just test the process. Use a recruitment maneuver, see if you can improve their gas exchange and their uh, spontaneous tidal volumes. That's a really great way for you to test your process, okay? And just an absence of change in PAO2 does not mean that you haven't recruited your patient. You always wanna think about FiO2 goes down, and satin PaO2 go up. That tells you that you have successfully recruited the lung. Always evaluate lung compliance. Remember, press that simple inspiratory hold button, release it, the vent will close the exhalation valve and we'll look at the peak plateau patient, uh, pressure. Now just remember what I told you before, peak minus peep or the gap between peak plat minus peep the difference between those two should go down. So everybody can just look at their ventilator and say, oh, here's my PP, it's 45 and my PEEP is 13. Well, that's a really wide gap, okay? That gap between those should reduce, meaning that as you've opened up the lung with your PEEP, you have more open lungs. So when gas flows in, you generate a much lower pressure. Really important in our understanding. The other thing is, we monitor changes in lung volume at the bedside. Patients will move more volume when their lung is recruited. So after I've done a recruitment maneuver, I'm gonna look at your spontaneous tidal volumes. Those should be the same or greater with a much lower pressure. Why? Why is the pressure lower? Because from a baby lung, we now have an adult lung. So the same amount of volume is gonna yield a much lower pressure. Now, remember, 
This requires that the patient is on a volume control mode, not a pressure control mode. In pressure control, you can't really measure those. So when we think about how the injured lung is best recruited, position. So first, you may not be proning, but you need to be turning. And then as the lung gets worse, we need to talk about proning, we need to participate in proning, and we need to do it the right way. The most important thing is to recognize that if my patient is hypoxic, increasing PEEP by two centimeters or four centimeters, waiting four or five, six hours, is not a functional way to actually evaluate what the patient needs. We need to have a therapist come to the bedside, evaluate the patient with a recruitment maneuver in order to actually communicate effectively about what PEEP that patient should be on to maintain lung opening. When you underutilize PEEP, you actually damage the lung and prolong the dysfunction. Now you're not writing those orders necessarily, but you are talking about what should be done for patients. When patients are hypoxic, we, and they're hypoxic and they have a high plateau pressure, we have to talk about recruitment maneuvers and adequate PEEP, because of course that's what's really going to improve outcomes for those patients. So the other things are just to minimize edema, try to control volume overload, uh, really reduce FiO2 to the lowest acceptable level. Obviously you don't want the patient to get, have a plummet of hypoxia, but the more lung you open, the FiO2 should go down. These are really important. So for best treatment today, always try to understand what the underlying cause of the lung dysfunction is. Always apply lung protective strategies when you are talking about mechanical ventilation. And when you need to open the lung, meaning your patient is hypoxic and the lung is non-compliant, we're going to apply PEEP and other recruitment strategies. We're gonna talk about it, we're gonna ask for it, we're gonna have a discussion about it on every patient who has hypoxia with stiff lungs. We will always have a discussion about alveolar recruitment. We're gonna support them hemodynamically because as we increase the thoracic pressure with our ventilatory strategy, you may actually see some hemodynamic instability, but if you don't control their hemodynamics and you don't recruit the lung, they are going to end up in an ICU much longer on a ventilator, much longer, and their risk of mortality is much higher. We're going to prevent all complications, if we can, of critical illness, that's DVT prophylaxis, nutritional support, et cetera. Avoid over sedation. So remember, we target a RAS typically of negative one to negative two, except when we're going to do a recruitment maneuver, then we're going to increase the sedation just because the patient will feel like they cannot breathe because you've actually given them continuous positive airway pressure over 40 seconds period of time. You don't want them to have anxiety. And then of course, using a weaning protocol with spontaneous breathing trials and with sedation holiday or sedation vacation. So you can see here too much volume in a tight vault. Let's try not to do that when we're ventilating our patients. And remember when you have evidence of it, got to talk about alveolar recruitment maneuvers. Don't be afraid to have aggressive position changes or to prone patients when necessary. Excellent. Well, thank you so very much for attending this conference today. Uh, I'm going to stop my share. I'm gonna come back here and I'm gonna stop my recording. I'm so grateful that you came today. Uh, unfortunately, that concludes the alveolar recruitment strategies. So there may have been some uh, misunderstanding for the MICU APP team, because this began at four o'clock today. All right, my friends. So